Good morning and welcome. Sorry, we just had some really weird stuff going on with the stream. I had I had uh, you know start stream and things blew up. So, you know, there's always fun stuff like that. Anyway, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be hailing from. This is Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents, episode number 36. We're going to be talking about uh, securing your data at rest today with tools like Lux and uh, network-bound disk encryption. So, of course, joining me every episode is the illustrious Brian Smith. How you doing today, buddy? Good. How are you doing today? I was doing great up until uh, up until that little <laughs> snafu with the uh, with the Chrome tab. Of course, I I thought I was being smart and waiting to update Chrome until after the stream because it says up in the top right corner you need to update. And I was like, I'm not pushing that until after the stream. Now I'm kind of thinking maybe I should have done that differently. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited for today's show, though. Like. <laughs> Network bound disk encryption and Lux in general. I mean, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And I think network bound disk encryption is probably one of the most underrated features in RHEL. And there's just like so much value there. So I'm really excited to talk about this today. And we get to talk about system roles. So, you know. Yeah, yeah of course. Of course. <laughs> well, with that being said, let's go ahead and bring on our guest for today. His name is Mark Thacker. And he is actually. What uh, what is your title these days? It's oh, it is my title, uh, Grand Poobah. No, uh, it I'm, is. I'm good um, with that. <laughs> no, I am a manager in the Red Hat Enterprise Linux Product Management Infrastructure Experiences Team, and I'm the former Security and Compliance Product Manager. So, MBDE is is one of the one of my proud moments of things that I've helped to shepherd in to RHEL as a product manager. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'm I'm looking forward to digging into uh, in, into how that came to be uh, part of RHEL. Uh, I'm hoping for a, a very uh, lackluster demo. Uh, we had some we had some demo lab issues uh, before we started too. So we're just we're just checking all the boxes today. Mark will never join us again after today. I, I'm afraid. Seriously, all worked <laughs> until I got here. Then... <laughs> Thanks. Sounds about right. <laughs> well, that being said, you, so you you used to be the security and compliance uh, PM. Uh, tell us a little bit about your your career at uh, at Red Hat prior to that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, by the way, may the fourth be with you. In, indeed, this this is the May. Um, yeah. So I've been with Red Hat now for about five and a half years. Um, I was actually hired in as the storage and data lifecycle product manager. And moved over to being the security and compliance product manager, where I have I have a um, great deal of history in prior companies doing product management for security technologies of other enterprise class operating systems, um, multi-level security technologies, doing a lot with federal customers, um, mandatory access control technologies, encryption, FIPS, common criteria, et cetera. Um, I don't know if that's the answer to your question. So anyway, I was the security and compliance product manager for a long time, pretty much five of those five and a half years, and then moved into a managerial role. So I have someone else on my team, Amy Farley, whom you may hear, hear from again in the future, I think. Uh, she has been our identity product manager, and now she's doing identity security and compliance. So as soon as I figure out human cloning, she will appreciate that since I didn't take anything off her plate. I just gave her more things <laughs> to do. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. Yeah, uh, Amy had like some live event or something. She she was too good to hang out with us today, but we've got uh, yes. we've got plans to to drag her kicking and screaming onto the episode uh, onto the show at, at some yes. point in the future. She's really awesome. <laughs> she yes. is. She's amazing. I get to work with Brian and Mark and Amy. Uh, Pretty much on a daily, if not weekly, basis. So uh, it's it's a great team. And well, that being said, I'm I'm excited you you joined us. And uh, and so why don't we just dive into this here? What? Uh, so it, I'm I'm afraid that this might have caused some confusion. But we we entitled this episode "Securing Data at Rest." So that seems like a good place to me to start. What do we mean when we say data at rest? Yeah, fair question. I want, hey, let's all participate in this. But um, data at rest, so okay, let's talk about that. There's actually kind of three different states at which you might want to think about securing your data. Data at rest, data in motion, and data in use. By the way, that last one is a pain in the Watusi to actually do in any real scalable manner. Um, the most obvious one that 
Well, there's two things that we're most obviously used to dealing with in the system administration world. Securing data at rest. And what does that really mean? That really means when, when the data is essentially on a storage medium, not actively being consumed, um, that is data at rest. Now that can mean on disk, that can mean on some you know, random access device. It can also mean on tape. So precursor to coming to Red Hat, I worked for a company that made purpose-built backup appliances and incredible tape storage solutions. So imagine your tapes in a vault need to be potentially encrypted to, pro to protect against physical theft, right? Someone grabs the tape, that's actually something that's very easily, you know, very easily done. You don't want them necessarily reading that data unless they are in the secured environment to do so. That's what data at rest is all about is protecting against the type of attack where the storage medium is typically removed from its environment, right? That's what you're protecting against is that kind of an attack with data at rest. Um, so, okay, with you, let me, let me go these other two route though, because they're really interesting too. Because when you protect data at rest, does that mean that it's somehow encrypted whenever it is in use? Does that mean that, you know, one person doesn't have access to it? Eh, not necessarily, right? Um, data at rest encryption can mean, for example, I may want to protect an individual file. I want to encrypt that file so that all the other users on the, on the platform, even if they have discretionary access to it, they can't access that content unless they have the proper, you know, encryption key or decryption key rather. Um, that is a valid use case for data at rest. That's not necessarily the problem that Lux solves. We'll talk about that in just a minute. There's data in motion. So most common example is over the wire, right? Data, anytime you use your web browser, this session is secured as a matter of fact, right? That's data in motion, typically between two systems, but it doesn't have to be. It's any time that it's not at rest, right? And it's not in RAM being executed on, it's going someplace, which can mean between the host and the storage subsystem, right? That's another place where data transits a lot. So how do you protect that uh, in addition to once it actually lands on disk? So that's data in motion. The final piece of the puzzle is data in use. So, we're used to securing things when they're not being touched. We're used to securing them when they're flying over the wire. But now I've got it executing in RAM. And as any good admin knows, root is awesome. And we can always go and examine things like, let's just go dump the memory of a process to see what is that, what is that secret file from soda manufacturer one doing on this system, right? I'm soda manufacturer two. I want to see what their secret recipe is. And you can totally do that, right, by dumping memory. That's where data, um, data in use encryption is very important. This is a tough problem to solve because guess what? You're executing on the data. There's a whole world of um, technologies called trusted execution enclaves, where the idea is the memory segment that's actually being executed has its own unique encryption key that is backed all the way up by hardware-based root of trust. Typically at the CPU level or below, you will have some ability for something that's outside of the operating system to attest to the data, the data model, the encrypted memory segment, and can control access to what is um, running in that encrypted memory segment, as well as who and what key was used to encrypt that memory segment. A bunch of words basically saying, if I want a secure process space to run my, you know, more sensitive workload, I want to be able to isolate that and keep it separate from other tenants on the machines or other workloads on the machines. That's, like I said, typically done with trusted execution enclaves. That's a relatively nascent technology uh, for everyone that's watching. Think of Intel SGX or Secure Guard extensions or Software Guard extensions, pardon me. Um, think of AMD SEV, which is Secure Encrypted Virtualization. Um, and think of other kind of enclave technologies from under, other vendors as well. I say it's, it's, it's a maturing technology space because there's not really good API standards. And every silicon vendor has their own solution, which is great, which means that 
if you write an application <laughs> to use that on Intel, it doesn't work on AMD, right? So there's all sorts of standards that need to be developed in the space. Good news is all of the cloud standards bodies are involved in trying to drive forward, you know, some standardization there. So you asked one question. I gave you like a long answer. Are you prepared for the rest of this hour to go by this story? <laughs> that, that was... Well, with that said, you know, we're that's we're at time. So, you know, thanks all for coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a, no, that but was the... a really that was a really good response. That was very informative. So, so Mark, you, you mentioned, you mentioned Lux. Can you talk a little bit more about what that is? And, and, and that's not something necessarily new either. That's been around for a while, but can you explain like, you know, what is Lux and, and, you know, why would I want to use that on my, on my rail system? Yep. Yeah. Great question. So, um, Lux and its corresponding component dmcrypt often get a little confused, but Lux is, it's an acronym L U K S Linux unified keying system. Um, Lux, for all practical purposes, is a way of encrypting software-defined volumes on your Linux platform. Uh, it is not unique to RHEL. Uh, it has been, uh, someone here that's smarter than me can probably remember, but it's been around in, in Linux for a very long time. Effectively, you can take any software-defined volume. And the reason why I keep emphasizing software is it has nothing to do with the underlying hardware, right? If you have a volume, of some sort, regardless of what hardware is backing it up, you can encrypt that volume. Um, Lux operates on two kind of keys. One is an encryption key, and that's actually, or the volume encryption key, that's actually defined the moment that you configure Lux on a volume, when the header is written. When that header is written, there is a software volume encryption key that's defined. That's actually what does the crypto on the disk. And there are a series of things called key slots for passphrases. And when you define a Lux encrypted volume, um, you have to give it at least one passphrase for one key slot. Okay. What does that mean? That means that any time that that volume is mounted, now I'll go back. The volume's unmounted. It's a software volume. It's just sitting around. You've got a running system. What about that software volume? Well, regardless of what the underlying hardware is, that software-defined volume is encrypted. If you go try to mount that volume or examine the underlying disk, like physical disk even, that are, that are backing that volume, you'll find cryptograph cryptographic garbage, right? It's encrypted text. That's actually the whole point. That is exactly the theft kind of model that you're that you're protecting against, which is that data at rest is encrypted. And should that data be um, copied, moved, stolen, that drive or that device stolen, you want it to be and remain in an encrypted state. Cool. Lux has done that for years. So it's, it's pretty simple, actually. So maybe I'll pause there before I go uh, further than that, because there are two different types of Lux as well. So, so just to back up on the, you said there's multiple key slots available. So for example, could I, if I was an administrator and I had a, you know, a fleet of laptops, could I set like a administrator Lux passphrase that, that I know, and then my users set their own passwords. And then I kind of have a way if they forget their passphrase that I could as an administrator still, you know, unlock the volume and, and, and reset their password. Yeah, that is an excellent question. And that is true. You can totally do that. Um, Lux version one, Lux version two, both support this concept of multiple uh, keys or multiple key slots, actually. And you can have multiple passphrases and you can set it up. Well, actually the way it really works is any one of those will allow you to unlock the volume. So that failover that you just talked about there or that backup concept is perfect use. You have the administrative one, the one that you, that you generated in house when you gave your employee their laptop. And then you could ask them or give them a process by which they can also set their own passphrase for the device. Absolutely. Downside about that is if they set their own passphrase, then that means they can give out that passphrase to anyone they want to, and that person can then unencrypt un that volume. All right. And we're going to talk about some solutions to that. Um, ah, what kind of devices maybe even? Can Lux apply to? Mm -hmm. I, I'm seeing some chat. 
it is it is as far as I know pronounced Lux, not Luke's. Although it is May the fourth, and I'm okay if we decide to call it Luke's for the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> yeah, Lux Lux um, Lux does work with any any volume. So I don't care if you have a RAID device or if you have a NAS device or a SAN device or an NFS mark posits temporarily. Well, NFS is a little bit different, but as long as you have a volume that presents itself as, as Linux capable storage, then you can encrypt it. The other question is sometimes you get what file system says it support? Don't matter. It's, it's at the volume level. Um, typically you will find that it's used with, um, logical volume manager, at least on rel. Um, and, um, Another good example, when you install RHEL, if you're using the interactive installer, and you choose to encrypt your storage with a passphrase at installation time, behind the scenes, we'll actually create a logical volume manager, an LVM volume, and put your storage into that and encrypt the LVM volume, right? So that is how that generally works. The file system on top could be whatever, ext4, it could be something else. Um, it could be XFS, which is typically what we default to. Yeah. Very cool. And in fact, that's that's one of the easiest ways to get started with Lux is right out of the installer, because it, yeah. it it is so difficult to. Well, I don't want to I don't want to belabor that. It's it's challenging to encrypt a file system after this after, is, after your services mm -hmm. or your server has already been deployed. So if you're going to start using disk encryption, I'd highly recommend doing it from the installer right out of the gate. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, in fact, we want to talk about that concept of re-encryption. Let's actually, let's talk about that now, actually, if that's okay. Sure. Um, with Lux, and I do want to talk about what, what, what happens. Actually, let's roll back. So we've encrypted a volume with Lux. We mount that volume either at boot time or sometime later. Let's take the easy example. I've got a data volume. It has my proprietary data on it. I'm running my Linux platform, my RHEL box. I mount that volume. It's encrypted with Lux, right? What happens? Brian knows, Eric knows, right? It prompts you for a passphrase. So you have to type it away, right? And that's all fine and dandy with I'm on my laptop and I've encrypted either say a flash drive or I have a volume that I occasionally use and I just want to enter in the password. And in fact, many corporations that use Linux as their primary desktop, um, that's what you see when you boot up your laptop is it asks you for a passphrase because it has to unlock. Oh, look, there's someone asking a question. Do I have to enter the encrypted passphrase every time I mount the volume? <gasps> yes, you do. It would be really cool. Wouldn't it be cool if there was something that would take care of that for you in a secure way? That would be awesome. I'd go for maybe, that. Maybe maybe a policy-based decryption mechanism. Yeah. Oh, but Mark, nothing like that should exist, right? Nothing exists. Not at all. <laughs> Especially not since RHEL 7.6 and network-bound disk encryption. <laughs> See, this all works together. This is this is a great concept. Um, Right, so you definitely do have to, without network-bound disk encryption or an alternative way of managing the Lux passphrases, you have to manually enter in, in the passphrase at every time you mount, which worst case scenario, you do this to your root volume, your server reboots at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh-oh. You've encrypted data at rest, but who's gonna type in the password at 2 a.m. in the morning? Yeah. Then that leads to all sorts of questions. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. I was gonna say, and I'll, I'll point out too, like say you're a system admin and you have a thousand systems and you patch them monthly, right? And so you reboot them every month. You know, with, with traditional Lux, if you encrypt the root file system, you somehow have to access the console on a thousand systems and type in that that passphrase. It's just, it's just completely unmanageable, um, which is why a lot of places historically have not encrypted the root file system because it's just, it's just not practical to do unless you had this policy-based encryption you, you keep talking about, so. <laughs> it's almost like we solved a problem that actual system administrators have. Wow, imagine that. Um, and we will get to that because it's important to understand what Lux is, what Lux is not, how it works before we get to network-bound disk encryption because in many ways, network-bound disk encryption or policy-based decryption 
its purpose in life is to make managing the Lux passphrases easy, right? But it doesn't change how Lux works. So mm -hmm. that's why it's important to talk about what Lux is. Yeah. Um, Eric asked about, or Eric mentioned, it's difficult to deal with encryption after the fact, right? Um, so there's, there's a couple of things that happen. If you already have an existing system and you have a volume that is unencrypted, it's just an LVM volume or whatever it is. Can you encrypt that volume using the Lux? Yes, you can. Okay. However, and this is where it gets a little tricky. You have to, if it's totally unencrypted in today's implementation, you have to unmount the volume typically. And then using Lux version two, which is available in RHEL 7.6 and after, you can start a um, re-encrypt process. And that re-encrypt will actually write a Lux header. There's a, it's, this is somewhat manual. You have to create space on the volume for a Lux header, write the Lux header that automatically creates a volume encryption key, which you never see, and ask you for a passphrase. And it's back to our passphrase discussion. One of the many key slots that you can earn. That will kick off a re-encryption process. Now, if it is, if it's Lux version two, yes, you can do an online re-encrypt, which allows it to run while the volume is mounted. But if you have to start this with an unmounted volume if it's unencrypted to begin with. And once you have an encrypted volume, uh, like I, I have some demo systems. My laptop has got Lux as its primary LVM partition uh, encryption solution. In RHEL 7.6 and after with Lux version two, you can actually change the volume key or add or change key phrases in your slots while the system is running. And that's actually relatively new. Uh, in RHEL 8 in particular, pardon me, you can now do online re-encryption of Lux version two volumes without having to unmount them. That only works if it's encrypted to begin with. If it's unencrypted, you've got to unmount it. Now, that may not sound like a big deal until you realize you're talking about your root volume. It's hard to unmount a root volume when you're running the system, isn't it? So, Or your enterprise application that yep, uh, your enterprise you app, depend on right? to make money. I, I will tell you there are some who have solved this problem in a unique way. You stand up a RAID volume where one volume of the RAID, like you're going to mirror, right? You've got an unencrypted volume. You stand up an encrypted volume that's configured with, with Lux, put those two into a RAID mirror and just let it go. And then over time, as it mirrors the right, you can then break the mirror and throw away the uh, unencrypted volume. That just it is, scares it me is on a way to do so it. many levels. <laughs> it's best to start off with an encryption solution to begin with. Yes, that's... <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know of people that do this. I'm. I mean, I was a sysadmin for a decade. I'm. I'm no stranger to coming up with strange and dangerous ways of solving real problems when you can't take your enterprise application down for five minutes to to do something the right way. Uh, but I mean, just that that whole notion scares the living you know what out of me. <laughs> it. 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 It is, it is a valid option. As long as you have the storage space available, then of course you can mirror to an encrypted volume and then you mm -hmm. just break it. It does work. I do know of a cloud provider that shall not be named in which this is the solution that's used to go from unencrypted to encrypted. Um, I often get the question, so what about, we haven't even touched on cloud yet. Oh my God, it's, it's, 27 minutes after the hour. Let's keep talking. Um, there are ways that you can... Um, uh, oh, so let's say that you have a master template image of your virtual machines that you want to stand up. And maybe you have them already with a Lux encrypted volume because that's how you set up your template. Then realize if you copy that template out a thousand times, then each one of them have the exact same Lux key in them, right? You don't really want that. But you can now change. Right. That's the other advantage is if you start with your your default golden master image with an encrypted volume, then at least now after the fact, you can just change the encryption key. You can change the key, key phrases and not have to shut down the system. That's why you want to start with encryption on. 
Well, so let's... we had a question come through in the chat, and and I, I kind of want to echo the sentiment here of, you know, this sounds great, having having data at rest that's encrypted and uh, having a key that's secure and hopefully something more than password one, two, three. But what what kind of overhead are we going to put on our system? I mean, this, this sounds like it's going to really eat away at my disk. Um, so that's a, that is a good question. Once the volume is unlocked at boot time, Yes, there are still, uh, there's a process called de-encrypt that actually will still intercept the reads and the writes and do the encryption on it and read and write it to disk. Uh, it is potentially measurable. I don't have stats on it, on how much the overhead is. It's, it's I'm not gonna say negligible, but I've never seen anything, and someone here will go off and find something on lwn.net, I'm sure. Um, I've never seen anything that makes me give pause because if you care about consistent encrypted data at rest security, then some small single digit percentage overhead is probably not going to be your, your big concern. Yep. Um, then we, we had another question mark about yeah. um, Lux one versus Lux two. Yep, yep, absolutely. So Lux Lux version one is the original version of Lux. It's the version one. Um, a couple of interesting things about it. It has um, a limited number of key slots. Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it's eight key slots that you can use for essentially passphrases of some sort. Um, it does offer AES encryption, and it has some limitations to the size of the key strength that you can use and the rotation, the ability for, pardon me, the process that's used to derive the volume encryption key is a little more limited. In Lux version two, you can have up to 32 key slots. So it's up to 32 passwords, if you will. Um, it has a much different approach to generating the volume encryption key. It's a much more secure approach, actually. Um, and it was designed to begin with, with the concept of flexibility. So we're going to talk about network-bound disk encryption, which solves the, the issue of not needing to type in the passphrase. And the way that we approach that for Lux version 1 is we sort of looked at the Lux header and went, well, there's, there's space in here that no one seems to be using. like." It's dead space, but it's not declared what it's supposed to be. So that's where we're going to stuff into it our information about how network-bound disk encryption works. Lux version 2, by the way, that works just fine. Please don't take my lackadaisical way of describing that to indicate anything about stability. In Lux version 2, it was designed from the beginning of the meta information for Lux is very flexible and very cleanly defined in the header, which makes it easier for us to both maintain things like network-bound disk encryption policies, and other future expansions to Lux. So it's newer. It's been available since RHEL 7.6. We introduced that because we knew that our default in RHEL 8 is Lux version 2. The default in RHEL 7 is Lux version 1, right? But you, say, you can read a Lux version 2 volume in RHEL 7. You can create one in RHEL 7. But by default, if you uh, run crypt setup, you get Lux version 1 in RHEL 7. You get Lux version 2 in RHEL 8. Very nice. Awesome. So I think I think you've teased everyone enough with the policy-based encryption. Let's let's talk about this in more detail. So so there's two main options for policy-based decryption in RHEL, right? There's there's the network-bound disk encryption, and there's a technology based on TPM. Can you can you talk about you know what what those options are and what you know some of the strengths and weaknesses are you know with those two yep. uh, two different options? Yeah, excellent. Uh, and I will try to do it with more um, brevity than I have previously. So uh, just to get some terminology, because this is a little confusing, and quite frankly, we changed how we wrote our documentation as well. Policy-based decryption is a concept. Uh, Policy-based decryption says, look, we have a solution for doing decryption based on a policy, and we know we can apply it to data at rest encryption. Now, there's other things that we can apply it to, but the most practical example is, hmm, Lux passphrases. That sounds like something we want to go solve. So um, the very specific concept of using 
the technology to automatically unlock a Lux volume when you are on a secured network that is known as network bound disk encryption. Now to keep the conversation really simple um, and because you run into these commands, we're gonna to refer to the technology as Clevis and Tang. What are they? So by the way, um, Nathaniel McCollum, who was the original architect of this technology, I had to go look at his white paper very closely because I didn't understand this at first. <laughs> um, Clevis and Tang refer to physical locking mechanisms. That's why it's part of this technology. Anyway, um, Clevis is a client. And Clevis runs in the early boot process of your REL platform. Clevis can talk to a Tang server. So it needs to be accessible over the network, whatever network is available at boot time. And through a unique mechanism, a key exchange mechanism, it's the McCollum Rayleigh key exchange mechanism, which there is a patent on that. We can essentially share um, public key encrypted blobs of data between Clevis and Tang. So how does this actually work? Remember those key slots I was telling you about earlier. When you take a Lux volume and you want to enroll it into a network bound disk encryption policy, what you effectively tell it, and we can hopefully show, cross fingers, this actually working, you tell the Clevis client on the system that you want to have automatically unlocked, you tell the Clevis client, okay, I want you to be in charge of this volume. Here's the IP address of the Tang server, which by the way, is completely in the clear. It's just HTTP, right? All that the Tang server sends back effectively is the public key hash. It's public key hash. That's all that it sends back. The Clevis client will take a look at and create, actually creates its own Lux passphrase dynamically. You don't even have to enter, it, enter this in. It creates a passphrase, then takes that public key. I'm so simplifying this. Takes a public key from the Tang server, uses that to break up the passphrase that it created. It writes that passphrase to disk that can only be decrypted using the public key, and then it throws away the public key. So that passphrase now is in one of your Lux key slots. Now, by throwing away that public key, does that mean that Clevis can decode that key and thus unlock the volume by itself? No, it cannot. Now, how does this work in real life? Great, I've got this encryption key that Clevis can't even read itself. At boot time or when the volume is mounted, Clevis runs an early boot or by system D invocation. Clevis detects, look, I see a key here. I have a policy that says that key can only be decrypted if I can reach this Tang server. I'm going to send part of this blob to the Tang server. The Tang server says, oh, that looks good. Here's, here's this blob back with my public key, right? Not exactly, it's not exactly how it works, but we're just gonna go with it. That public key comes back to the Clevis, or Clevis client who can then decode that key. It passes that into the rest of the boot process or DM crypt. And assuming that that all came back correctly, bink, your volume is unlocked automatically. You don't have to run in a passphrase and you're good to go. This works for root volumes. It works for other volumes. It even works for flash drives. So I don't have this set up, but if you have a Lux encrypted flash volume, and you are on a secured network, I put it into the device, into my laptop, Clevis picks it up, looks at the policy, tries to reach the Tang server, gets the Tang server's public key, uses that to decrypt, automatically unlocks the flash volume, and it's mounted. Now, what password do you need to know as a user? Nothing, right? Let's go back to our theft problem. Someone takes that disk out of the server can they unencrypt it using the Clevis information on the disk? Nope. What well, if they put it into a Linux box and try to unencrypt it that way? If they're not on the same network as the Tang server, it won't matter, right? So that's, that's how network-bound disk encryption works. There's probably lots of questions. 
but we do also need to talk about TPNs as well. And I just, I just want to point out one thing real quick is <clears throat> this all sounds super complicated, right? To set up, <laughs> but this is, this is actually, I have to say, probably one of the easiest features in RHEL to set up and get started with. It, it is, it's the Tang server is super easy to set up. The Clovis client is just a couple of commands, right? It, it, it sounds much more complicated than it actually is when, when you go to implement it. It really is. Um, the other question I often get about Tang is, okay, so this sounds like it's a public key, public key infrastructure, a PKI. What about what do I need to do to secure the Tang server? And what about all those keys on the Tang server? There's one key on the Tang server. It does not keep state. It does not record anything about the client, right? Uh, that is huge. Because think about it, early boot. What is running at early boot? Almost nothing, right? And we wanted to make sure that the Tang server was really lightweight. That's why there's not even encryption between the Clevis client and the Tang server. Because if you wanted encryption over the wire, where are you going to put that TLS certificate? How are you going to validate it? You don't have anything to begin with, right? So you don't even need it. The Tang server doesn't keep state. A single small Tang server running in a container or as a daemon, thousands of simultaneous Clevis clients can access it, right? It's very, very scalable. And it's super, it's one command. I will hopefully show you in the, the web console here. It's so simple. Yeah. So, so Mark, tell us about the the other option here, the TPM based option for policy based decryption. Yep. And then I promised Tony, we are going to get to system roles. I promise we will talk about system roles. <laughs> we um, for sure we'll talk about system we're roles. We're going to talk about and I'd like to show my demo, but we'll, I'm talking a lot. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm never getting invited back. Um, so trusted platform modules. So this Clevis client that I just talked about, it can definitely talk out to a Tang server, right? Um, but we also had requests for, but what if I want to be able to unlock with a hardware-based uh, root of trust? And that's where Clevis learned to talk to a trusted platform module. All right, so we have these Lux key slots that Clevis creates its own unique key that's encrypted using the Tang public key and a bunch of fun math, right? That takes up one key slot. However, the other thing that Clevis can do is say, all right, instead of or in addition to using Tang, that's super important, I want to create a passphrase and associate it with the value stored inside of a trusted platform module. Uh, raise of hand here, who doesn't know what a trusted platform module is? Okay, just kidding. Um, yeah, okay. If you run any Windows 10 uh, qualified hardware in your shop, it has to have a trusted platform module in it, period, full stop, because BitLocker uses it, right? So trusted platform modules have been around forever. And the trusted platform module is used during boot time by RHEL, specifically if you have secure boot enabled, right? Don't give me grief, just go turn it on. If you have secure boot enabled, your system will measure the boot environment, the kernel command line, the kernel, the shim, the kernel loadable modules, and create cryptographic hashes of each one of these things, and essentially extend or store them into one of these trusted platform module slots. The TPM, by the way, typically a dedicated piece of hardware can be in firmware, supposed to be physically and electronically tamper-proof, Tamper resistant, somebody in legal just raised their hand. Tamper resistant, typically on a, on a physically separate device, they're actually RF shielded as well. They can be, right? So you cannot literally use a radio to determine what the keys are. That is a valid spoofing, valid hacking technique. So this TPM, you can think of it as a cryptographic black box. At boot time, the system measures a bunch of stuff about itself, generates a cryptographic hash, and sticks that information into a TPM. Clevis can be told, all right, here's the way you're going to work. You are going to seal your secret based on a value that's in the trusted platform module. Now, at next boot, when Clevis decides to unmount your root volume, it will go retrieve that information from the TPM, that value, not the passphrase, and use that just like it did that public key from the Tang server to attempt to decrypt the key 
the pass phrase, pass it to the boot, the boot environment and continue to work, okay? Uh, as long as that value in the TPM has not changed, everything works perfectly fine. Now, can anyone spot a potential problem if you only rely on a TPM? What, what if your whole laptop gets stolen? <laughs> Yep, that's exactly the problem. If you only rely on a TPM, then if someone takes the TPM, the storage, and the software all, eh, <laughs> then the, you've done nothing, right? You have not protected against that kind of attack. Here's my recommendation. Clevis has this concept of um, Shamir's shared secret, which is a fancy way of saying when it creates that passphrase, Clevis, you can actually have it depend on multiple tank servers and or a trusted platform module, or as I like to say, do both, right? That way you have to have a machine that has not been compromised and you have to be on a secured network for it to automatically unlock the volume and continue booting. That to me is the best combination. Some people have asked, what about the tank server? What if it goes down? Okay, well, one, you could still manually enter in the passphrase uh, or two, you can have multiple tank servers. You could even set your policy to where you could do this. The TPM being present or the tank server being present is sufficient enough to automatically unlock it. And that would be okay too. This again, sounds really complicated. It's just a couple of lines in the config file and you're done. Like you don't have to know anything about TPMs to do this. Right? Yeah, and you can yeah, just, yes. Yeah, so, so, you, so you could have like three tank servers and you could say when my system boots up, I have to talk to all three to, to boot up unlock or I, you could say i just seen one of the three or two of the three it's all very configurable and and, and easy to set up and, and one other thing that that's kind of cool is you can have the tang server also be a clevis client of another tang server so you can have your tang server encrypted and yeah have it rely on another tang server to automatically boot up which is kind of cool yep uh, here's a little side note by the way openshift list versions of openshift actually use clevis and tang so they actually support network mount disk encryption for the data volumes that are the backing behind the system. They're used by the RCOS, the Red, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux container operating system that powers OpenShift. They can actually have all their volumes encrypted using Clevis and talking to a tank server. And by the way, the tank server now is available in container. So you could actually have one cluster backing the other one up from a tank server liability point of view. And that's all rel underneath the covers. And you can uh, use a TPM. Sorry. I don't know, Mark. I'm not buying it. This sounds like it'll take me hours to figure out. And Hey, you want to do I it mean, right now? You don't even have a whiteboard, so I don't know if I can no take this seriously. All right. All right. Challenge is accepted. <laughs> hey, um, let's let's share some stuff. Let's let's look at what a okay. My litmus test for technology is Canon product manager actually do this on my own <laughs> without using a system role, although I love system roles. The answer is yes. All right, so let's take a look. Um, I'm going to show you uh, I'm going to show you a couple of different systems here. We're actually going to go take a look real quick at do 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 do. All right, I have two systems running um, right now. And of course this is all being done uh, real time, so who knows what's going to actually happen as I tried to demonstrate this. <laughs> there we go. So what you're looking at right now is the Tang server system. This is the web console interface in RHEL, by the way. Oh, um, in case you're wondering, if you wanted to know what version of the operating system this is, this is definitely a RHEL non-operating system. I'm just saying. So let's take a look. That's Remember that point. Tang server? Oh, what are you doing? No, just do a search. Oh. See, it'd be helpful. All I had to do to get Tang up and going was DNF install Tang. Uh, I'm done. That's it. That's all I had to do. The Tang socket server I have set up to automatically run. Now I happen to have it listening on port 80, but you can listen on any port you want to. This is it. This is the entire backend server configuration. Done. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to leave this watching, and we're going to look at something here in just a minute. Let's go look at the client. Now I switched over to the client system, which is this little box right here. Um, but just so you can see, release. Yep. 
And I know you probably can't see it, but I'll do an LSBLK so you can see the volumes that are on here, right? All right. This is you mind, this you is. Am I pulling the, that window up just a little bit there? Yeah. I've oh, got this sorry, blown up as, Oh yeah. I've got this it blown up really as, as big as I can, just to, yeah, that's just so folks at home can see it. Yep, my apologies. So reading the actual words don't really matter <laughs> because hopefully this will work really well and you'll be so impressed with the actual boot process, right? I'm looking at the web console interface on the client system. So let's take a look at its storage infrastructure. Um, well, I happen to have a boot volume, a data volume, and a root volume. So let's go take a look at boot. Now, when I created this VM, I created it with an encrypted file system, right? So I'm just going to go take a look at the uh, logical volume manager two. And boom, you can see that it is definitely an encrypted file system. Now, wait a minute. If I scroll down, what am I seeing here? Well, it's telling me that there is definitely a Lux passphrase in slot zero. And look, all I had to do to enroll this volume in network-bound disk encryption was give it a key server address. That's it. This address is the Tang server, right? So that's all I had to do was add that address to the list of keys on this volume through Web Console, and I'm done. I can actually show you that it, that is the exact same over on this volume here, which is the data volume. We'll take a look at this. And look, there it is again. 192.168.122.21 is the tank server. HTTP doesn't even need to be HTTPS. It actually cannot be HTTPS. It doesn't need to be. So all that complicated things, all this time that Mark's been wagging his chin, it's one entry in Web Console and you're done. That's it. Why aren't you using this? It's so simple. All right, let's take a look at something real quick. Ah, I already see that Tang actually responded to something in the background. That's because I actually had it query. I'm going to do the unthinkable. I'm going to reboot a system real time. This is the this is the Clevis client, right? It doesn't matter that you can't read it because we all know what will happen. Um, remember what we talked about way at the beginning of this, Lux without anything else being present, will prompt you for password at boot time. Yes? So what we are doing right now is we're rebooting the client. Over on the left-hand window, if you can see it a little bit, the left-hand window is showing you the logs from the server, the Tang server. So what we're looking for is that little window right there that you can see. The bane of every admin's existence at 2 a.m. in the morning I would have to manually enter in my passphrase, right? Or I could just wait. By the way, this is way slower because this is on my laptop. Did you see something change over on the left? What you actually saw was the Tang server said, oh yeah, I got you, buddy. I'm good to go. And boom, it spit back out the appropriate public key. And look, my client booted. Hands off the keyboard, I never entered in a passphrase. So you sure you didn't type right. in the passphrase, Mark, when we weren't looking? Okay. I, well, I didn't. I, Scott Turner, I didn't. I really did. That's yeah. pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And, and and just like I said, think back, you know, if you have a thousand systems, you patch them and you, you reboot, they all automatically boot up like that. With that and, and they're still yeah. encrypted. It's it's just yeah. an amazing technology. Yeah. So you're, you're telling me. You're, you're telling me that if the Empire were to just run network-bound disk encryption at that facility on the beach, that the Rebellion never would have gotten the plans for the Death Star. That's, that's what I'm taking away from this. I, yeah, and also, I don't typically jump onto, onto um, uh, tape racks that are multi-stories tall to go grab a tape <laughs> out. But, Jen Erso, good job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, right? If they would, th they should have had their tank server physically at a different location, by the way. That's the way you do this, is that you put your tank server outside. Um, there was a question, a good one from Tony, which was, what about, can't someone take the tank server and take his public key and then just go around, run around willy-nilly and unlock your volumes? 
Sure, that's why you also rotate the tank server's keys, which it's built in to do that. In fact, that's where Brian can, yes, thank you, Tony, that's perfect. Yeah, we can absolutely rotate the keys on the tank server and you can instruct the Clevis client to look for a rotated keys and rebind itself using those rotated keys. In fact, I'm gonna stop talking because we are gonna talk about system rules because Brian, I know we have a system rule that helps with this. Yeah. Yeah, man, this episode has been awesome. We have the web console and we're gonna have <laughs> system rules, which are my two my two areas. So. That's what right, I so get yes. for having a product manager as a, uh, as a co-host. I know, right? I think we've talked about system rules on almost every episode I've done. So it, it's, anyways, it's, yeah, so it's we, a running we, joke nowadays. So, so we do have, there's two system roles. There's an MBDE client system role and an MBDE server system role, right? And so these can help you automate this process. Um, you know, like Mark talked about, it, it is fairly simple to set up. But if you do have a large environment where you want to implement this or you want to have it implemented as you're building new systems, right, you want to have an automated method to, to do that. And that's where the system roles can really come in and help out. So the system roles can help with, you know, getting that Tang server stood up initially. It can help with day two operations. Like Mark mentioned, you can use the system role to rotate those Tang keys. Um, you can even use the system role to collect the keys from your Tang servers and pull them down to your control node so you can back them up, stuff like that. So the system role can do all kinds of, you know, stuff like that to help streamline this process and make it, make it a little bit easier. Um, the MBDE, Client role, on the other hand, can help you automate the implementation of that Clevis client. So, you know, that initial binding um, uh, and, and, and that process. Um, so, Eric, can you go ahead and bring up bring up my screen and I'll, I'll talk. We, we're we're kind of short on time, so I'll, I'll talk through this pretty briefly. Um, but this is a video. Um, we have it on YouTube, so we can we can post a link here in the in the chat so you can watch the whole video. But basically what I have here is I have a control node. Um, which is running system roles um, and Ansible, right? So um, that's where the system roles package is going to be installed. And then I have five rel clients. I have a couple of rel eight clients, a couple of rel seven clients, and then um, a, a rel system I want to be my Tang server. Okay. So all of these are, are um, and they are they're already encrypted on the root file system. But every time I reboot them, I have to type in that that passphrase manually, right? So what I'd like to do is implement MBDE so that, you know, I can now reboot these and they'll communicate with the Tang server and uh, boot up automatically as long as that Tang server is accessible. So let me just fast forward a little bit here. Um, so what we're going to talk about here is there's a readme file for both of the roles you can look at. So you can look through the readme file and see all the role variables and see an explanation of how um, how the roles work and what options you have. Um, okay, let me pause it here. So this is my my inventory file for Ansible that I'm going to use. So I basically have two different groups of servers here. I have an MBDE servers group where I have a single Tang server. Um, and then I have an MBDE clients group where I have my four clients. I'll also point out I have a blog out there too that is a more advanced example where I have three Tang servers and the Tang servers are clients of each other and it does all that fancy stuff. So if you want to see a more advanced example, um, there's a blog we can point you to as well. So this is really it though. This is my inventory. I just have the two groups defined with the servers I'd like to implement this on. Okay. And then as far as the role variables for the MBDE clients, all I'm going to do is specify the device that's currently encrypted. So this is the root file system device on, on my systems. And then I need to provide the current Lux passphrase, because when you do the binding, you have to already have the passphrase to, to let Clevis bind. So you could put this in here in clear text in the in your uh, in your inventory file. Of course, that's not really secure. So what I'm doing is using Ansible Vault so that this is an encrypted passphrase um, for, for, you know, supplied into Ansible. OK, and then I specify down here under servers, I specify my uh, Tang server that I'd like to bind these clients to. And I'll fast forward here a little bit. Um, okay. And then this is the actual um, playbook um, that I'm going to run. So I have um, the top task here is going to open the firewall for the Tang server. Um, so it's just port 80. 
And I'm going to run the MBDE server role, which is going to deploy Tang onto my um, Tang server that I have defined in that inventory group. Um, this was a, a, a workaround that was needed at the time. Um, I believe this is no longer needed, so you can just ignore this section if you're on a, a recent version of RHEL. And then this, this bottom part here is just going to run the MBDE client role to set up Clevis. So you just run the playbook using um, Ansible playbook. Okay, and I'm also going to put the ask vault pass since I had, had encrypted that, that variable that had my current let's pass raise. That'll prompt me um, to supply the, um, my vault password for, for Ansible. After I run that, that's it. it. It runs for a couple minutes. And then later on in the video, I go ahead and reboot and show, just like Mark's demo did, the system just boots up on its own. You don't have to type in that, that passphrase. So super easy to implement um, with, with the system roles. And, um, and we'll, we'll put in the chat here a couple of links to those blogs where you can find more information and, and a link to the video where you can, where you can watch this demo. Yeah, the awesome. like what Mark showed us is is kind of from from a live perspective is is kind of disappointing um, because you run it and you configure everything, you reboot, and it just it works, and it's it like works. no drama. Yay. So yeah. there there needs to be like a fanfare or confetti or something. Um, say hey, or like a dollar check works. gets sent to me every time that MBDE <laughs> successfully works. <laughs> That'd be fine. <laughs> so we did have a couple of a uh, couple of questions that that uh, that we wanted to address as we wrap up today. Um, for instance, uh, if someone if someone uh, has a break in at a data center, doesn't that leave all of that data decrypted uh, in a way that can be siphoned off? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so the answer is it depends on what exactly you're talking about. But remember, you've unlocked the volume. So we're not protecting against the case of someone can legitimately or illegitimately access that device, right? The, the volume's unlocked. It's it's unencrypted in its use, data in use, right? But you're not protecting against the case of I've unlocked the volume and it's in an otherwise good location. Oh no, someone can access that volume. Then you're talking, you know, AC Linux, mandatory access controls. That's not the use case that we're protecting against. We're protecting against that volume is unmounted or, you know, be that because the system is asleep or someone physically removed that disk. That's what we're, that's the use case or the attack vector that we're trying to protect against. Yep. Uh, so someone what, asked what about, I'm hearing is you're going to have to come, come back for a future episode to talk about those other use cases. Anyone want to talk multi-category protection with SE Linux? We can totally do that. <laughs> it is encryption at rest. Now there was another one, uh, Eric, around, hey, what happens? Can you disable auto decrypt? Remember it's that prompt that we saw? Yeah, the break glass. You remember what we were looking at when I was desperately waiting for my VM to actually finish booting? It was the normal Lux enter in the passphrase, right? So if you've left the original, remember those key slots, right? So you have at least one key slot and I chose to leave mine there because you have to have one key. So when you add something to Lux, another key, you have to know at least one other key to, know, to add a key, right? You could delete that other key now that you've added it. But um, as long as that's there, someone that knows the passphrase can still manually enter it in and it'll, it'll unlock. Because any, any Lux key phrase that successfully <laughs> authenticates will unlock the volume, including the old fashioned manual one that's still there. You can delete that manual one if you want to, but then you don't have a break class option. That's why you have redundancy. That's why you have multiple time servers. Yep. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, this has been awesome, and we've had multiple requests in the chat for you to come back for a future episode, oh, so Lord. I think we'll, we'll definitely have to do that. Um, it, it takes quite a bit to, uh, to get kicked off the show, so... Uh, um, I mean, Brian's come close a few times, but uh, <laughs> no, not at all. But uh, yeah, definitely going to have to bring you on. Uh, there's there's just so many different facets of security, and and I I saw it somewhere in the chat that security is is all about layers, uh, and we talked about two uh, we talked about two single solutions for basically one use case here. I mean, we talked about Lux and in in DB in 
B D E. I have it written down so I could remember it. And, uh, uh, and and just how that affects data at rest. This isn't. This doesn't cover network traffic. This doesn't cover uh, like we were talking about the the uh, the the break in and someone having access to a console. So I mean, there's just so many other layers. And to be honest, it's something here at Red Hat and especially with Rel that we don't talk about enough is is going through some of these use cases and talking about how how do we how do we address these issues. Um, and and that doesn't even begin to cover. Uh, so I don't have a physical data center anymore. How do how do I secure something on like a partner with like AWS? Uh, yep. So we'll definitely have to have you back on in the future, um, cool. and we'll have to bring Amy in as well to talk about some identity uh, solutions, uh, single sign-on certificates, I, uh, IDM. <coughs> but uh, unfortunately, we are out of time for today, uh, so we'll have to bring Mark back. Uh, we'll make it so he doesn't have a choice. And, uh, but, uh, so we're, we're actually shuffling the schedule around a little bit. We don't have an episode plotted for, uh, for, for, uh, for episode 37 just yet. We've got a couple of things we're, we're looking at a couple of people that we're, we're begging and pleading to come on the show. Um, but, uh, in the meantime, there's, there's this little, little get together in Boston and, and virtually, um, what I, is I, it called? I, it's a uh, thing, right? I mean, it yeah, feels like, like I've been there before. Coffee hour or something like that. But you'd be like I, a, like you're at the pinnacle of a mountain, <laughs> like maybe a summit. <laughs> summit, yeah, summit. Like, um, is it is it Tang Summit or something? Or no, be, Red Hat. Clevis Summit. Oh. Clevis Summit. Yeah, I love okay, it. We'll go with Red Hat <laughs> Summit. Fine, Red Hat Summit. Uh, but yeah, Red Hat Summit next week, uh, May 10th and 11th. You can tell I haven't been sleeping much. I've been having like daydreams and uh, and night dreams about about Summit and the uh, the, the conference at uh, uh, the, the the conference center. So if you're going to be at Summit, by all means, just look for the guy with long hair. Um, actually, there's a good one. How about Orange Tang Summit? I I, I like this. We'll we'll work on rebranding Summit. How about how about we work on that next episode? Anyway, folks, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mark, for, for being a guest. And on behalf of my co-host, Brian Smith, thank you all for joining Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents episode 36, I think, whatever episode this was. There went my beautiful radio outro. And <laughs> Anyway, we're done here. I'm Thanks, hitting Mark. the red button. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Appreciate Brian. It. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.